Good morning. Good morning. I do this every time. I kind of tear up the microphone when I take it out of the stand, but that's all right. I've learned how to put it back on. <laughs> it's good to see you. Let's all stand to our feet, please. Aren't you glad to be here today? And oh, I just feel a hint, just a hint of some fall. So I'm thankful for that. And uh, I'm just thankful to be able to be in God's house and worship with people who are here for the same reason. Amen. Yes. We're going to enjoy his presence. We're going to lean on him hard today because you know what? There's no other place that we can find peace. There's no other place that we can find security. No other place that we can find what we need because he says that he has everything we need. We just have to lean on him and, and push hard into him. So today, let's do that. Let's do that. Let's, and let's start out by worshiping him and praying to him. Father, thank you for the, your presence today. Thank you, Lord, your promises that where two or three are gathered in your, name, in your name, you're there in the midst. So, Lord, we come to worship you, to exalt you, to honor you, and to just to lift you up. And, Father, I thank you. Lord, you're right there with open arms to receive us, Lord. Father, there's so many things going on in so many people's lives right now. Lord, we need your shelter. Lord, we need to hide in the cleft of the rock today, and that's you. You are the rock. And so, Father, I pray that as people walk in here, walk down these aisles, sit in these um, chairs today, Father, that they would experience not entertainment, Lord, but they would experience the enveloping, the enclosure, security of your Holy Spirit as he wraps around us, Lord. Because we need to draw closer to you, Lord, because things are so bad <laughs> if we're trusting in other things and it's just no hope in that. But Lord, there's hope in you. And everybody said, Amen.
encounter with him today. That's why he made this day. He made it for you and for me to have fellowship, worship, and a relationship with him. That's what this day is all about. I know we all got stuff. We got to do this, got to do that. We got to get on with this day. But it's really about being with the Lord. I'm glad you chose to get up and come out and enjoy worshiping the Lord together with us at Open Arms Fellowship. And if this is your first time, I got a cool looking pack just like this for you right back there on that back corner. So grab one of those. It's just for you. And if you're a regular attender and you got some prayer needs or you got something on your heart you want to share with us, there's a card underneath the chair in front of you and you can just simply fill it out, share what's going on in your life. You can drop it in our offering box. We'd love to get cards. We'd love to pray over the things that are going on in our lives. And we got, you got a prayer guide when you came in today. And on that prayer guide is is, is Nora. And if you don't know about Nora, pray for her and her cancer. If you don't know about Brandon, pray for Brandon. If you don't know about Diane's mom, be praying for Diane and her family. And you got stuff to pray about. I know. We all do. And so we want to have a time of prayer together. And you're invited, if you would like to join us here at the altar as we pray, you're invited to pray at the foot of the cross from the back, right there where you are. Let's go to him in prayer this morning. Father, even this week, in my journey through Proverbs, you reminded me of how many thoughts and ideas that flow through my head, and there's so many, there are gazillions. And yet, they're nothing compared to your plans. And Lord, even now, even this morning, thoughts and ideas and feelings, and yet, they're nothing compared to you and your plans. So, Lord, I'm praying for focus, for my focus, for the focus of the people in this room, for focus of people who are watching online, that we would just stop all the stuff in our heads and our hearts and focus on our awesome God. Just see you face to face. Worship you. Feel your presence. Just let all the noise confusion, the heartache, the stress, all that just stop for a moment. And look at our Lord. And worship our Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you that we can pray for others. Lord, I do lift up Diane and her family and her mom, and I miss seeing her mom here and the journey that she's on. And God, you know you're in control. You are. We need to see that in Scripture. We need to remember you are in control. Even when we don't see and we don't understand. But you are. Be real in their life. Lord Brandon, just lift him up and continue in his journey. And Nora and so many others. God, it's just it's good to see you doing things. I look back there and I see some folks in, who are here today. That God, they've been on a tough physical journey. God, you've restored them and you've given them strength and they're back again. So thank you, God. Let us just lift one another up. Let us pray, as you told us last week in Scripture, for, for the work of Open Arms Fellowship, for the work of Barnville Baptist, for Hampton First, for every church in our community that's lifting up the name of Jesus. And Lord, today, let us examine our hearts and minds and walk out of here with an absolute assurance that Jesus is our Lord and our God.
song is about the Great Commission, our command that we, are, we should go and tell the world about it. And the song is like painting the picture of, um, from the point of view of Jesus, and he's telling the disciples to go and tell the world about him as he ascends back into heaven and how he's got to go, but his spirit is with us and that we are here to do his work on earth. So if you know, sing along. Think about the words of the song. Think about what we can get from it, what we can, uh, our command that we can do. We can go out from here and tell the world about Jesus. See my hands and look at my feet. It's okay. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor 
and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So as it says in that verse, Jesus is the name above all other names. Jesus is the name above every sickness, every problem, every issue in your family, in your marriage. It doesn't matter what it is. And in this song, it says that. It says, I speak the name of Jesus. I speak the name of Jesus. And it um, even says, you know, you shout it from the mountains. You shout it over your family, over your community. And so that is what our prayer is, our cry of our heart is this morning when we're singing this song and as we um, minister this song to you guys. So if you would, let's just stand. I know it's a new song, but the words are up here. It's very simple, very easy to learn. Just meditate on these words and just as we're singing, just think about, and I know it's probably not hard to think about situations in your life where you need to speak the name of Jesus. Speak the name of Jesus over that situation. Declaring there is hope and there. 
do what's going to happen in this place today. Yes. Amen. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Woo. She sang Jesus so loud it turned on the power. Yes. <laughs> Shout Jesus from the mountains. There it goes. Here we go. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Wow. 
So thankful for you guys. Go on. You know, I don't know if it's true. It said it to be true. It said to be legend. I don't know. But it was said that the great, famous NFL football coach, Vince Lombardi, would start off a season with his football players saying, gentlemen, this is a football. He would say, why would he say that to a bunch of NFL professional football players? Well, we all need to be brought back to the basics. Gentlemen, this is a football. You know, in confusing times, it's easier to get pulled off of the basics, of our foundation. The more confusion, the easier it is. And we run after that good sounding thought, that good sounding cause, that good sounding person. And so we run after that or that or that because in all the confusion, it's easy to get off of the basics, the foundation. Every church has dysfunctions because every church is made up of people like me and, and you and we all got dysfunctions. <laughs> But some churches have a greater degree of dysfunction than others. 
That was my first church. They were so tied to their traditions, they didn't realize it was killing them. They were so tied to each other, they didn't realize that they were excluding anybody else from coming in. They were so fixated on things that didn't matter that they had totally forgot about the things that did matter. When I came in, it was really easy to get caught up in that because that was part of my tradition. And it was easier to go with the flow than it was to, to begin to try to change the way people thought and the way things were going. The only thing is, God wouldn't let me stay that way. He had already taken me down a different journey. And, and I couldn't change the church culture overnight. In fact, I couldn't even change it after four years. But everything had become focused on a Sunday morning service and a Wednesday night service, and neither one of them were very good. I was going crazy. And so I went back to the basics. I hit the streets. Started ministering to people who weren't a part of our church. Angie and I turned our house into a place where we invited people who weren't welcome at our church. We began to do some non-traditional things in our yard and in the churchyard when the church people were there. <laughs> we got back to the basics of ministering to lost people and hurting people who were far away from God. And I needed to be brought back to those things of Jesus. What Jesus had done for me and what Jesus wanted to do for others. See, something happens when, when all this confusion starts coming around us. And so much confusion, we, we, we hit an overload. We hit a breaking point where we don't know what to do anymore. And we don't know where to turn anymore. And we, we get to a place where we don't want to hear any more news. And we just, we want to be on a deserted island all by ourselves. Anybody ever felt that way? You know, uh, you know why the guy who was on the deserted island by himself had two churches, don't you? Because he had a fight and a split in the first church <laughs> on the deserted island by himself. See, confusion even happens in church. And it often happens in church because the world around us is so confused and we bring all that confusion in with us because we're confused too. And, and in that confusion, we often forget the basics. We forget the foundation. Because, man, that thing sounds good, and maybe I should do that. Or that person sounds good, maybe I should go there. And that cause, that's really a needed cause, maybe I should get involved in that. And guys, the truth is, we got so many things going wrong in our culture that, that there's a lot of things that need to be fixed. And there's a lot of great organizations out there working to fix them. And I have people ask me sometimes, preacher, should I, should I give to this? Should I support this because they're doing this? And maybe so. But if we're not careful in all that confusion, even in the good things, we get pulled away from the best things. We get pulled off of our foundation. We get pulled into the confusion of going after that good sounding argument, that good sounding cause, that good sounding thing. And, and it's easier for that to happen when there's more confusion. And the thing is, we don't even often realize it's happening because we're not going after something evil. We're going to something good. But the good is pulling us away from the best. And so we find out we're in confusion before we know it. So when those kind of things happen, what is yours? What is mine? What is our, what's our foundation? What's our base? What is that thing that we know we can stand on when, when the confusion of life comes? Because it's coming, if it's not already all over you. When, when the emotion, emotional confusion, emotional issues come, when sickness comes, when financial issues come, what's our foundation? Or when we hear that good thing or that good thing, and, and we think, maybe I should go for that or go after that. What's our foundation? How do we know? How do we know should we should be involved in that? Because here's the reality. There are things, there are people, there are organizations who are fighting for our time and attention every day. And God, we only got so much time and attention, don't we? <laughs> and if we go there, we, we can't go there. 
And if we do that, we can't do that. And if we give to that, we can't give to that. So how do we know? What's our base? What's our foundation? What's the basics? Confidence in Christ crushes the confusion. Y'all with me? I got four C's for you today. Confidence in Christ crushes the confusion. I don't matter, it don't matter what the confusion is, confidence in Christ will crush it to where we have clarity. I don't usually come up with all that. <laughs> Guys, confidence, I want you to hang on to that. Confidence in Christ crushes the confusion. Because I guarantee that every one of us in this room have some level of confusion in our life about something. And you might think, well, it's not a big thing, or maybe it's this big thing, and it's just, it's just shadow overing us. Confidence in Christ will crush the confusion. You know, Adam and Eve had it going on. They had everything they needed. They had a solid foundation. They walked with God. We don't know how often they walk with God. We don't know how long that took place. We only know that the wording in Genesis says it was a regular behavior. So they're walking with God. They, they got it. They got everything they need. But then came a good sounding, good looking, good opportunity. They thought. They had a solid. They knew what was good and what was bad. But. Oh, it sounded good, it looked good. What do we do? Do we go for it? Or do we stay on what we know? Or do we go for this new thing that sounds good, looks good, must be good? Well, they drifted off their foundation. A little bit of confusion moved them. They made a decision that was devastating. Not only for them, but for all of us. In fact, we, we talked about that Wednesday night in our small group about the inheritance of sin, the sinful nature. And we missed y'all diving deeper in desserts. Man, what pile of desserts we had here, guys. Man, it was like sugar overload. This Wednesday, it's our children. Kids and candy. Bring your candy. Come support our kids as they lead us in worship. But Jesus knew that we needed to move back from that devastating behavior to a solid foundation. So Jesus came and he lived a life to say, guys, this is how you live. And then he died for you and for me. And he came out of that grave to give us victory over all this confusion. Confidence in Christ crushes the confusion. Let's pray. Lord, I knew I needed this message when I was studying. I had no idea of the test that was coming even this very morning. And oh, do I need this. I need to get back to the basics. I need to get back to knowing who you are, Jesus, and what you're doing be reminded of it every day. And Lord, I know that even now, even as we go through these passages, our thoughts, our emotions are going to run after things that are on our heart and our mind. We just got to get back to you, Jesus. Focus on you, Jesus. Watch you crush the confusion in our hearts and our minds and all around. Colossians 2, we continue our journey. And as my seminary president said, guys, this is like drinking water from a fire hydrant. Hang on. Colossians 2, verse 8. Hope you got a Bible you can read and understand. If you don't, I would love to give you one after the service today. Be careful not to let anyone rob you of this faith through a shallow and misleading philosophy. Such a person follows human traditions and the world's way of doing things rather than following Christ. The wording of the first part of verse 8 should be like a red neon flashing sign. Warning, watch out, danger, there's a breakdown ahead. Things are coming and you need to be careful for it. 
Really, that should, should be that kind of alarm to us because it's written in a way, not that it's just possible that you're going to get misled, but it's probable that you're going to get misled unless you are ready, unless you are alert, unless you're focused. And then Paul uses some interesting words. He uses the word philosophy. If we're not careful, we'll give bad ideas to good words. The word philosophy is actually a very good word. In fact, all of us need to be practicing philosophy every day. Because the root of philosophy is the search for truth. And man, do we need truth in a world filled with non-truths. Every day we need to walk in God's word and walk with God's spirit so that we have a philosophy of the day, a truth from God for the day. We need that. Because I don't know about you, but I see a lot of stuff coming at me. And it looks good, it sounds good, but it's not good. But I don't sometimes know that until I've stepped over in it and find out it's not good. No, I need the philosophy of God. I need the philosophy of the Spirit to know truth before I step into something that's not. But Paul says, no, guys, we're not talking about that truth that I'm warning you about. Here's the truth I'm warning you about. Shallow and misleading philosophy. Oh, Guys, we have that all around us. It's nothing new. It's the same thing that got Adam and Eve. It's the same thing that's gotten us before. It sounds good. It looks good. It feels good. It must be good. No, it's not. It's a, it's a philosophy. It's a truth, but it's a misleading truth. It's a shallow truth. Most of us can take a journey back in our lives and we can recount some of those truths that we followed that we thought were true truths. They weren't truth. And that's why the Holy Spirit and Paul said, Hey, guys! Warning, warning, warning! Don't go for those things because, look, he, he, he tells us how they're presented. Such a person follows human traditions and the world's way of doing things rather than following Christ. See what he's saying? Confidence in Christ is going to crush that confusion. But if we're following these other things, if we're following the human traditions, if we're following the world's way of thinking, we're going to fall to those misleading and shallow, or misleading and yeah, shallow philosophies. We talked about that Wednesday night in our small group. We talked about how some of our beloved traditions have actually pushed people away from God. Mm. Really? Yeah. Sometimes the confusion is closer to us than we think. Sometimes the confusion is here and is here because we're living our life based on a tradition that we've been taught. And unless we start to question those things, I and Ronnie shared so how real it was for them. And I've been, until we start questioning some of those things, we don't realize that we could be the one who's causing our own confusion. Because we don't want to face the fact that maybe mom and dad were wrong and grandparents were wrong. I'm going to tell you, the day I realized that I was racist, it was one of the most painful days of my life. It was painful because I had to realize that my parents had taught me wrong and my grandparents had taught me wrong and generations had taught me wrong. And I was in this tradition that I thought it was okay and it was normal. Some of our traditions are causing our own confusion. And there's always people trying to get us in on other traditions and follow their ideas and, and get on their bandwagon and lead us into some of those shallow, misleading philosophies. Politics. Ooh, mercy. Want to get a conversation going? Just bring up some politics. Guys, we need to be involved. We need to be vocal. We need to be praying. Because we've got to be careful that we never allow our political stand to overrule where Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, even if they belong to the other political party. 
You see, what happens is we get in this tradition, we get in this mindset, we think, this is true, and if you're not with me, something's wrong with you. we got to get back to the basics. Christ. Don't follow after that thought, that feeling, that good sounding Christ. It's got to be built on Christ. We know that. I'm not telling you anything new in the church, and I know I'm not telling you anything new, but guys, it's so easy to get away from the basics. It's so easy to run after this good cause, that good cause, that good condition, that thing. You've got to get back to the basics. Christ. Because confidence in Christ crushes. Christ's body. And God has made you complete in Christ. Christ is in charge of every ruler and authority. In Him you were also circumcised. It was not a circumcision performed by human hands, but it was a removal of the corrupt nature and the circumcision performed by Christ. This happened when you were placed in the tomb with Christ through baptism. In baptism, you are also brought back to life with Christ through faith in the power of God who brought him back to life. Kristen said, man, that's a lot of verses and a lot of meaning. Absolutely, it's loaded. <laughs> Look at the first statement. All of God lives in Christ's body. <clears throat> this is the only place in all the Bible that this phrase is said the way it is said. And scholars say this is probably the strongest argument in all the Bible for the deity of Jesus Christ. How about that? In a little book called Colossians, as you might not even know it was there a few months ago, is one of the strongest statements for the reality and the truth that Jesus and God are one. It says all, all means everything. Every essence, every part of God was in Christ's body. Now, if you've grown up in church, I'm not telling you anything you haven't heard before. I'm not telling you anything new. But guys, we've got a lot of philosophies around here. It says, well, Jesus wasn't God. They even say, the Bible didn't even say Jesus was God. Well, they're all wrong. Right. The Bible says all of God was in Christ's body. <coughs> even Jesus said, me and the Father, we're one. We're one. Now, do we understand it fully? No way! But we better hang on to this true philosophy. That God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they are one. We don't have this mean God up in heaven who's just wanting to zap us for every bad thing we do while Jesus is running around here trying to save us from this mean God who's trying to zap us. No, we've got a God. A supreme God, an all-creative God, a God who knitted you and I together in our mother's womb, who loves us so dearly Jesus. that he took on the flesh of Jesus to come down here and to live for us and to die for us. Hallelujah. Guys, don't give in to some philosophies that say God doesn't love you. Don't give in to your tradition that you say, I've done this and I've done that. You don't know what's in my past. God can never love. God loves you and me more than we could ever dream or imagine. Amen. Ronnie was even sharing a story this morning about that. How people who seem to be far away from God and yet they pray and God answers their prayer. Why? Because God loves us, period. Yeah. Doesn't matter our baggage. Doesn't matter our past. He loves us. He loves us enough to take on flesh and die for us. Oh, don't be moved from that basic truth. Don't be moved to a philosophy of a mean God who's out to get you. Don't be moved to a separation of a God over here and a Jesus over here. No. It was God in a way we could see him. 
It was a God in a way we could touch him. And it was a God who wanted to come down here and be with us because he loves us so much. All of God was in Christ's body. Guys, we could go on for a while on that one. And, look at the, the verses, and I'm like, and on top of that? How could there be an and on top of that? Look what he says, and God made you complete in Christ. Now, he's, he's writing to Christians. So this is a message to believers who have surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. Again, I could probably spend the day on this. This one statement, God made you complete in Christ. When this word made you complete, it's actually a nautical term. And if you were with us last week, Paul was led by the Holy Spirit to use another nautical term when he said, you know, I want you like a sail field headed in the right direction. Now he uses another nautical term. Made complete means you have been made ready for the journey. You have everything you need for the journey. Now think about this in the life we live. Think about this in the picture of this passage. Now, if you were in the Colossians time, if you were going to take a journey, you would most likely take a journey on a ship. And there wasn't anything like the cruise ships we see today. <laughs> and most likely, you would have had to be involved in helping prepare that ship even though you were a paying customer. You didn't just go get your air-conditioned cabin. You had to help bring the food on board, bring the water on board, get the ropes ready, get the sails ready, and on and on. It was a lot of stuff to get ready for the journey in Christ. I love this. In Christ, He has made us ready for the journey. We got all we need for the journey. We don't need any of the world's philosophies for the journey. We got all we need, guys, for the journey of life. We're not lacking anything, Christian. Amen. We don't need to run after that, run after that, run after that. All we need is in Christ. That's right. That's what he's saying, guys. Everything we need for the journey of life. You got it? You got it. So why do we run? after this and run after that and got to have more money and got to have more of this and all we need for the journey of life is found in Christ. That's it. So when sickness comes and overwhelms us, what do we do? Walk closer to Christ. Because he's got all we need. When the stress and fears of, fears of life come at us, what do we do? Walk with Christ. Because he's got all we need. As I was doing this, as I was going to this passage, I thought about my buddy Whitney up there in Kristen. Angie and I have never lost a, a born child. We lost a child before Angie was born. But they lost a child after. And I've ministered to couples who've lost a child after <coughs> they were born. And that's the thing that's going to make a marriage stronger or it's going to separate a marriage. And that's the thing that's going to cause you to run to God or run from God and often forever. And they chose to walk closer to God. Did they understand it? No, they, they still don't understand it. But what you do when life comes at us and guys, we all got stuff. Maybe it's the loss of a parent. Maybe it's the loss of a job. Maybe it's finances, finances just crashing and loss. Whatever it is, you just name it. Christian, we got all we need for the journey yes. in Christ. Most of you, that's nothing new. You knew that already. But how easy it is to get off the basics. To say, I need to do this. I need that. I need to join a Facebook group so I can post my frustrations. No! We got all we need in Christ. He's already prepared us for the journey. Now, guys, think about that. You know, tomorrow's coming. Does anybody know what's going to happen tomorrow in this room? I don't have a clue. I know my plans. I know what I hope. I don't have a clue. Jesus does. And for his children, he's already prepared us. We got all we need. But I didn't 
didn't know that was coming. No, I didn't either, but he did. And in Christ, we got all we need for the journey. <sighs> Told you I could go on with that one now. Mm. <clears throat> but as it says, Christ is in charge of every ruler and authority. I could spend an hour on that one, guys. <laughs> Just think about it. Now, we say it. We know it. We hear it in church. God's in charge. God's in charge. We know God. Really, do we know God's in charge? When the political waves don't go our way, do we still believe God's in charge? When the job situation don't go our way, do we really believe God's still in charge? When sickness hits us and I feel like our lives are falling apart, do we really believe this statement, Christ is in charge of every ruler and authority, that means on earth and in the world around us? We've got to get back to the basics. When life seems scary, when it seems like something's out of control in my life, oh, what am I going to do? Christ, oh, he's in charge every rule and authority. Boy, oh, I needed to hear that today. Oh, I needed to hear that today. I need to hear that every day. I need to be reminded of that tomorrow. God's a food giveaway. Somebody remind me of that tomorrow. I, need to, I know it, but i got to get back to the basics and believe it. Don't believe some other authority. This whole world's going to hell in a handbasket. No, Jesus is still in charge. No matter what it feels like, no matter how I feel, no matter what it looks like, he's in charge. 11 and 12. In him, you are also circumcised. It's not a circumcision performed by human hands, but it was a removal of the corrupt nature and the circumcision performed by Christ. This happened when you were placed in the tomb with Christ through baptism, and in baptism you were also brought back to life with Christ through faith, in the power of God who brought him back to life. Wow, that's a lot right there. It's another way of understanding the salvation of Jesus Christ. And I can't develop this all, but it goes back to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God had his people to physically circumcise themselves, to have them set apart, different from the rest of the culture, and as a picture of removing the sinful nature. They did it physically. We come to Christ as our Lord and Savior. He does it spiritually. He removes the corrupt nature from us. See, God had them to do it physically because He was getting them ready and us ready. That's what the whole Testament, the whole Old Testament's about, is to help us get to a point where we understand Jesus. Remember, we talked about it a few weeks ago. Everything is funneled right to Jesus. All the Old Testament is pointing us towards Jesus. And the circumcision is the removal of this sinful nature. And it says it happens in baptism. And he's not talking about the water baptism. He's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When we give our lives to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus comes in and gives us a new life. We don't have to live that old sinful life. In fact, it's day. And look what he says. Through faith and the power of God, we can be brought back to life just as God brought Christ back to life. Do we believe God? Do Jesus came out of that grave? Yes. We say we do. In church we do. At Easter we certainly do. Back to the basics. If Jesus came out of that grave, if God could bring Jesus back to life, he's telling me in the same passage of Scripture, he's going to give me a new life. I know it's nothing new. But have we drifted away from believing? Have we fallen into the world's philosophy to say, well, I've been this and I've done that and I can never be this? And no. That old guy, he did. In Christ, I'm a new creation. All things are new. Confidence in Christ. 
crushes the confusion. 1350. You were once dead because of your failures and your uncircumcised, corrupt nature. But God made you alive with Christ when He forgave all our failures. He did this by erasing the charges that were brought against us by the written laws God had established. He took the charges away by nailing them to the cross. He stripped the rulers and authorities of their power and made a public spectacle of them as He celebrated His victory in Christ. Amen. Ooh, yeah. yeah, amen. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, this is like this is like the trophy of getting back to the basics. In sin, we're dead. Started with Adam and Eve. We inherited the sin nature from them, but guess what? We all chose to sin. So we perpetuated the problem. We can't blame it on anybody else. And remember from last week, there's only one thing in this life we deserve. Death and hell for eternity. You see, the moment you and I sin, we broke God's law. And in breaking God's law, there's a penalty just like in breaking man's law. Now, if we get it down through Hampton, where it's 35 and we cruise at about 50, and we hear, whoop, whoop, and we see blue lights. We pull over. And we know, we know. Heart's starting to beat fast. We're trying to come up with some lame excuse. We didn't know how fast we were going. Why? We knew. And we know that if we don't happen to get a merciful and graceful police officer, we're going to have a ticket to pay. So all of a sudden, between that, Split second of that officer leaving their vehicle and coming to our window, we're now trying to figure out how to get on the good side of that police because we know we killed. And there's a ticket. There's a price to pay. And guys, God's law is exactly the same. The moment you and I sin, we broke God's law and there's a ticket. There is a price to pay. And that price is to die and spend eternity in hell. But we have a merciful and a graceful God. And while you and I had the ticket, God took on flesh and came down here as Jesus and he says, I will pay your ticket. Yeah. Yes, I deserve it, you deserve it, but Jesus said, I'll take it. And he nailed our ticket, paid in full on the cross. Right. And look what he says. Look what he says to us. When we accept Jesus as Savior, he erases the charges that were brought against us by the written word of God. See, all this in Christ. It gets erased. It's gone. Guys, it's not God up there holding back His judgment on us. Oh, no, no. See, in Christ, it gets erased. It's not even there anymore, guys. I'm talking all that stuff we've done. Oh, no. It's gone. God's not up there waiting to hold it against us. No, it's gone. Yeah. You raised. Yeah. Now, did I tell you anything you hadn't heard before? Probably not. But oh, how we need to get back to that basics. Because you and I do a pretty good job of beating ourselves up for our sin. And there's people around us, they love to beat us up for the sins of our past. No, Satan loves to bring us back up and beat us up. But that's not God. See, that's us going after some lame philosophies that says, well, you're the product of your past. And your past will determine your future. Not in Christ it won't. 
Yeah. I'm a new creation. All that stuff, it's gone. Yes. So the moment we're beating ourselves down for what we did then, in Christ, it's gone. Yeah. Guys, we've got to get back to the basics. Otherwise, we get so confused. God, how could you love me when I've done this? God, how could you use me because of that? If I have given my heart and life to Christ, and you've given your heart and life to Christ, it's gone. You waste. I need that basis. Confusion is real. It's all around us. It's in our culture. I think more so than ever in the time that I've lived in America. I think confusion is in its highest point. It's not only around us, though, guys. It's in us, in our own traditions, in our own beliefs. <laughs> Tim was sharing with me a message he heard out there. <coughs> the preacher was talking about things we buy into, like God helps those who help themselves. Guess what? That's a tradition. It's not truth from God's Word. But we all have some of those things in here and in here. We let them dictate our lives. We've got to get back to the basics. God and Jesus, the one and the same, who loved us so much that He came and lived and He died for us. And He came back to life so that you and I could have all our stuff race and have a new life with him. Back to the basics. So, have you ventured away from the basics? Followed some confusing thoughts and ideas? Or maybe this was all new to you. So good. Now you've got the basics of life and how to live it. You know what? You got a decision to make. You're going to go after the philosophies of the world that often sound good, look good, but they're always changing. The true philosophy confidence in Christ. Christian, you got a decision to make. What's clouding your confidence in Christ? What tradition, what philosophy have you been running after? This is clouding the issue today. Let's just get back to the basics and put our confidence in Christ. Would you stand with me as I pray? Father, I thank you so much for this journey in Colossians. I thank you so much for this passage because, oh, did I need it. And I knew I needed it, but I didn't know how bad I needed it. I need, I need a renewed confidence in you. I need to be reminded that you, Jesus, are in control. And the moment you went to that cross, you defeated. You defeated all the authorities. Pilate, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the demons, Satan, you defeated them all. And the celebration of humanity began because now death no longer has a sting. And in Christ, death is but the next step into the life that you have planned for us, God. Thank you. Bring us back to the basics and the confidence in you. Guys, this altar is here for you to come and say, here, take it, Lord. Take this confusing thing out of my mind and my heart. Don't let me run after this thing. It's just creating confusion in my life. I'm here. There's guys in the back. Maybe this is the first time you've heard this stuff. Oh, come and give your life to Jesus Christ. Watch all that stuff just be erased for all eternity.